We're on to um, our medical assisting panel. Um, so if our um, medical assisting panelists, Tanya, Kylie, and Melissa, will please turn on their cameras, we will get started. All right, wonderful. And thank you to the three of you for joining us. Um, Again, for those of you, uh, for the participants just now joining us, my name is Brian Dozer. I'm the president of Vitalink, which is a nonprofit that's been working with Santa Ana College um, to develop this. Uh, we work with all community colleges, all K through 12 uh, school districts and all of the ROPs in Orange County to help introduce students like yourselves to um, career opportunities in fields um, ranging from engineering and computer science, which we did yesterday, um, to the health field, um, medical assisting, which we're going to talk about now, nursing, which we just did, and then we'll be talking about EMT uh, in a little bit. Um, I would like to encourage um, all of you to post your questions in the Q&A. Um, if you see a question that you like, please upvote it. Um, that would be fantastic. We had some great questions on the last one. Um, and then lastly, um, make sure you complete the survey at the end because your feedback is important to us for, for any future panels that we do. So panelists, um, what I would like for the three of you to do is just to introduce yourself, um, name, title, company, and then tell us a little bit about your organization, what it does. So Kylie, do you want to start off? Yeah, absolutely. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kylie. Um, I am a recruitment advisor for medics. Um, I don't know if any of you were on the last panel, but medics, um, we are actually a national healthcare recruitment firm. Um, we specialize in primarily just healthcare. Um, I oversee our allied division in Orange County, Los Angeles County, and San Diego. So doing all the direct patient care positions, your nursing, medical assistance, EMTs, front office. Um, that's kind of what Melissa and I tag team together. And we just help with the preliminary interviewing and onboarding, even direct hiring um, for, you know, any position to hospitals and organizations small and large across California. All right, wonderful. Tanya? Hi, Brian. Thanks for that. Um, I work for the Vista Community Clinic. It's actually located in North County, San Diego, but we have seven different sites. Um, Vista is where five of our sites are. We do have one out in um, La Habra, um, Lake Elsinore. So if anybody lives a little bit more inland or is willing to move the compute down, um, the Vista Community Clinic has all types of services. Um, we have nurses, medical assistants, um, practitioners, you know, it's a community clinic. We usually serve, um, you know, underprivileged communities, but we take all types of insurance. And my role here is the program coordinator for a medical assistant program that we run. Um, this program is a six month accelerated class that we are in collaboration with um, Cal State University San Marcos. So we uh, um, offer in, in class right now, we're kind of doing like a hybrid situation um, where we're doing Saturdays um, in person, but mostly online. So. Um, this program is conducted twice a year since it's six months, and, and that's just a little bit about the program. All right. Melissa, welcome back. Thanks, Brian. Um, I work alongside Kylie Lyle. So Kylie is our healthcare recruiter, and I'm the account manager. So I work directly with the clinic managers and HR to help um, help them out with staffing needs. And then Kylie kind of helps with the um, interview process to find good qualified candidates for anything in the healthcare field. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to lead off with the same question we led off the last one, but I'm going to uh, pick on Tanya first. What do you wish someone had told you when you were at the beginning of your career? Um, I, I think not rushing it is really important because it's a methodical um, and it's your time and it's an investment in yourself. And if you kind of just jump the gun going into something that you feel or that you think could be a good opportunity, um, you might miss an opportunity that you could have seized otherwise. So I think really doing your research and understanding what your goals are and making sure that you're setting goals is important for your success in the end because committing to something that you really don't have an interest in, um, you know, could hinder you in the long run. Sure, all right, fantastic. Kylie? Yeah, piggybacking off of that a little bit, I think it's so important to be patient. Nothing comes immediately, so, just knowing, you know, it takes time, but with that, it always pays off. And I think the biggest thing for me is just always giving everything you have. Hard work never goes unnoticed. 
even when you have a job, I still always act like I'm still working an interview and Mm -hmm. constantly, constantly proving yourself and giving 110%. Nothing can never go wrong when you're trying your hardest. Okay, fantastic. And Melissa? Um, I'll switch it up a little bit from my last (laughs) advice, but I would just say get involved. Um, Talk to as many people as you can, ask questions, educate yourself, just learn as much as you can about anything in the field, just to expose yourself more so that in the long run, kind of like what Tanya was saying, um, you know, you won't pursue an opportunity maybe that you might not, you know, potentially want to pursue long term. So just really educating yourself on everything or anything you can. Okay. All right. Um, So one of the questions that was sent in by the participants um, when they registered was, what are the specific challenges for um, these occupations today? Tanya, you have any thoughts on that? Um, I can't speak about that necessarily across the board, but I know at least for the medical assistants that we train, a big um, big obstacle is being bilingual. Uh, Since we are located in Southern California, Yeah, being able to speak Spanish is really important to be able mm. to provide the right response to our patients and also like making comfort or families feel comfortable because a lot of times, um, you know, kids that are going in to translate for their parents um, and children sometimes may withhold information. And if you don't know how to speak Spanish, you may not know what they're saying. And that also kind of goes with, um, I think, being aware of sexuality. That's kind of a big thing right now, too. Um, knowing kind of like if someone has different kind of issues going on knowing their their background history and medical history is really important and um you know properly reading their their patient charts all right fantastic melissa or kylie you have any thoughts on that okay so uh was wait melissa were you about to answer no (laughs) okay all right Um, i can totally answer sorry my computer was cutting out but you're do you mind just asking the question one more time so I can make sure my answer is correct? Yeah. What are what are challenges for these occupations today? Yeah, I think at least in like the interviewing process from what I see, I notice just like a lot of hesitation or not being fully committed when interviewing. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think the biggest takeaway I've seen at least lately when you're putting eggs all in one basket or putting eggs in a million others, just make sure when you're going through the interview process, like you are interviewing other people, you're interviewing the agent you're working with, you're interviewing that other company and really asking as many questions. I think a lot of people will accept positions that they aren't completely aware of and maybe they're only notified of all the good and not the challenges and difficulties that they're going to face in that job. And As you can imagine, then, you know, you're upset or things don't plan out. So I just think the biggest thing for if I was a student, you know, just make sure you're really spending time and committed to your decision and really dig in and ask questions. When you're interviewing, I think the biggest piece of advice is just making sure you understand that role completely. Sure. So um, just thinking broadly about medical assisting jobs, what does a day look like on the job um, as a medical assistant? Melissa? I should have addressed that to you specifically. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. I mean, again, I'm not directly in the field. I can only speak to what we see with our clients, but yeah a lot of day to days from what I see, um, you know, when I'm talking to clinic managers, when I'm helping them recruit for another medical system, we have to ask them what their day to day duties would look like. And we see similar trends across the board in terms of, you know, for back office medical assistant rooming patients, taking their vitals, doing injections, blood draws is huge. So, um, you know, there's sometimes medical assistants, you don't necessarily learn that when you're getting um, your education or maybe you only do it a few times and then you don't really do it um, you know later so I would encourage everyone maybe to if you're pursuing your MA degree to um, maybe also pursue like a phlebotomy license or something like that just to expand your own skill set um, because a lot of clinics you know sometimes they require you to have blood draw experience as well but it's you know, front office, it's verifying insurances, um, you know, checking in patients, things like that. So very standard medical assistant duties, but that's kind of what we see across the board in terms of daily job duties. Okay. Tanya, do you see anything differently? Anything to add? No, I think she hit that on the spot, Melissa. They do, um, you know, a lot of front office, a lot of back office. Um, 
at least for our, our MAs, we also require them to do um, immunizations. So mm -hmm. they also process lab work, um, a lot of phlebotomy, you know, venipunctures and um, also, you know, children from pediatrics to adults. So it's not just like a certain age bracket either. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, we, we called this um, employability skills in the age of uh, hiring, hireability and, and employability skills in the age of COVID-19. Um, so Kylie, what effect is this having on the medical assisting industry? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, our regular business clinics, outpatient clinics, things like that. Early on, we saw a huge um, kind of crash. People had a furlough, permanent employees, temporary employees. It was kind of a scare. If it was a specialty clinic, for example, like dermatology, we saw a ton of dermatology offices closing just because, um, not that it's not essential, but um, different specialties, we have to keep in mind that those kind of shut down. So that was really difficult. Um, in terms of COVID business is what we're kind of calling it. Um, there's been a huge spike, as you can imagine, in medical assistant needs, clerical needs, administrative needs, LVNs, RNs for, you know, rapid COVID positive 19 testing in these COVID clinics that are popping up. And in addition, I've actually been working with an organization since early March um, responsible for the 12 pop-up shelters and recuperative care sites for actually like homeless and underserved communities of Orange County and LA County. So there is quite a lot of opportunity to help. Um, I think the biggest thing is someone who is coming straight out of, you know, maybe a career college, they're looking to get right into a clinic or an office setting. And I kind of see the foreseeable future is they may have you know, a different experience before getting into that if this COVID-19 business keeps going the way it is. There's a lot of opportunity to help there. Okay. Um, Melissa or Tanya, you have anything to add on to that? Um, we're actually experiencing, like, we're, we're trying to do telehealth mostly mm. to limit the amount of patients that are coming into our clinic. And also a lot of people are afraid to come into the clinic on top of that. So, mm -hmm. um, as we are, you know, having a lot of people, we're not government, so we're not necessarily for loading, but we are doing like per diem. We have some of our um, employees going, you know, part time, like maybe 20 hours a week um, or less than that. But we also have a demand for MAs just because we want to keep those people on per diem, but we do need temporary, um, you know, full timers. And it's kind of like a weird time right now, but um, their, their duties in the clinic are, you know, way less interactive. Um, you have to schedule patients for certain time gaps, maybe 15 minutes, um, and it's mostly telehealth. So we'll see a lot of our medical assistants just on the phone um, or, you know, virtually trying to um, assess people rather than have them come in. Okay. Um, what, so in, in terms of um, trying to get into the field, um, how important is, are, are things like internships or experience? Um, you know, one of the questions that we talked about last time that, that um, we've talked about across all the panels is, you know, how do I get experience without a job because I need experience to get a job? And so, um, you know, any thoughts on that, Melissa? Yeah, I know there are, I don't know specific programs, but there's programs that I've heard of where um, outpatient clinics that we work with will partner with um, mm -hmm. medical assistant programs Will they'll hire them on as externs. Mm -hmm. um, and that works for, it's kind of a win-win for both because when you hire them on as an extern, they can get experience. And then if they do really well, they might just hire them on as, you know, a permanent employee moving forward. So I would look into the medical assistant programs that you're applying to and ask if they have any agreements with clinics that are open to bringing on um, new grads or new MAs who, vir who have virtually no experience and that way they can gain, you know, real hands-on experience. Sure. Do, do any of you think that COVID is, is impacting that, you know, and, and by impacting, I mean, making it more difficult to find those opportunities? It might. Um, I'm sure it is. I haven't seen it directly, but I'm sure it is just because um, I'm sure, you know, I think Tony mentioned a little bit earlier, there's a lot more telemedicine now. So it's mm -hmm. not necessarily working a lot directly with the patients. It's a lot less interactive. So I'm sure that's kind of affecting it. But 
Um, hopefully, maybe they're finding a way to kind of implement that still where medical assistants can get some experience. Sure. Um, so one of the questions that that um, that was asked by students was what newer changing technology should students be aware of? I, I would imagine that right now, especially if telemedicine is coming up, that there are some different types of technologies that they need to be aware of. Um, Kylie, um, could you address that? To be honest, I'm not very well versed in the telemedicine. Okay. I really haven't been working with that. So maybe Tanya can speak better. But um, what I do know just about like this COVID business and what kind of sparked my memory and kind of ideas around what you were saying if someone doesn't have necessarily experience and they're trying to get experience. I know multiple, um, you know, COVID clinics and different organizations in that field, they do have openings for maybe someone who's willing to do check-in or who is, um, you know, speaks another language, like just open to helping. I know you can gain experience and there is no licensure or anything needed to help out and you will get paid. So um, I'd be happy to, um, I can always put my email in the chat. Mm -hmm. We do have quite a few of those types of positions and it, not, it may not be hands-on. They're not going to let you draw blood, of course, if you're not licensed, but um, if you're willing to check in and help out the community, absolutely. There's a need for that and there's no, no licensure needed. Okay. Tanya, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I kind of want to, I'm going to cycle into these two questions here. Um, you sure. previously asked about how, like, if you don't have any experience, how to get into the field. So mm -hmm. For our clinic, um, you know, there are positions that are all you need is a high school diploma, um, like a being a PSR, which is a patient, a patient representative, patient service representative, so like a front desk attendant. Um, most of the people that we like to accept into our program, not most, we accept everybody, you know, who qualifies and you know, is a good candidate. Um, they don't have to have PSR clinical experience, but um, generally they have a little bit more of an interest because like I was saying when I answered that first question, what I wish I would have known entering the field, um, was having more of a plan together. So kind of like strategically thinking about, okay, if I want to be a medical assistant, but I don't have any experience and there's no way I'm going to get clinical, um, hours, like our program right now, we usually have 30 interns at a time. We have seven because we can only have one per site per day. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, backlogging four or five months, our students to graduate, um, so that keeping that in mind, you know, kind of having a strategic plan of how you can get somewhere, like starting somewhere, getting your face known, learning the clinic managers, making friends, you know, and kind of like going on and networking is pretty important there. Um, but as for the telehealth um, technology, every single clinic for the most part uses their own, not every clinic, but most places use a different kind of EMR reporting. So um, that's just like if you've ever been a, a server or like a hostess, they have a different POS system and it's just different across the board. But for the most part, Zoom and tracking information is commonly Excel sheets and kind of just shared in the clinic or, you know, like on the L drive or on some kind of drive. Um, that's kind of how we're starting and trying to progress. Okay. All right. Uh, I would imagine that there will be um technology companies that are going to try and create products that will, will fill some of the needs of, of, uh, of clinics and uh, hospitals and doctors. Um, so Melissa, for you, um, what about soft skills, non-technical skills? Um, you know, obviously they're the, they're the, um, the things that can be learned in a classroom, um, but you know, what's the difference maker um, for people trying to break into medical assisting? Yeah, definitely just being really empathetic and being caring, smiling, making the patients feel welcome, especially if you're working in a medical front desk office where you are the face of the clinic, you're the first person that, you know, someone who might be feeling sick sees when they walk into the clinic. So making sure that you are calm and patient, understanding that these patients are, you know, upset, angry, not feeling well. Um, soft skills is going a long way, especially now with COVID, you know, people, it, the uncertainty is very scary. And I think it's really important for people to remember to remain calm and be reassuring and um, happy and positive. Um, they're going to go a long way, especially again, now with the pandemic and everything. Um, now more than ever, soft skills are very important. Okay, fantastic. Um, Tanya, you have any thoughts on that? Okay. Kyla, you want to add anything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I think a lot of our clients, it sounds really silly, but they really look for someone who's bubbly and outgoing. And I know that's difficult if I get it. Not everyone's bubbly and outgoing, but in terms of front office, like you're the first person that they see. So when interviewing, like Melissa said, you know, smiling, bubbly, um, you know, just being friendly and smiling. I think a lot of us forget to smile, especially like in an interview, even if you're nervous, just don't forget to smile. And then in terms of just, um, you know, like efficiency, being able to multitask, I just think that will set you apart from any other person and bringing up like, you know, that you're eager, you're able to learn things, pick up quickly. Um, I think efficiency is going to be really important, especially with COVID-19. I think if things continue to be as high of a volume as they are, um, just being able to do the job thorough, but very efficiently is going to set you apart. Okay, fantastic. So you mentioned interviewing. Um, you know, this is one for me that, you know, I'm later in my career. And so um, I sometimes forget that, um, especially younger students have never interviewed. And so um, what are, um, what are, what it, what are some tips or what is some advice that you can give to someone who's going into an interview for a medical assisting job? Uh, Kylie, since you, since you brought that up, do you want to address that? Yeah, absolutely. So going into an interview, um, I would just always make sure you have your resume and make sure that the interviewer has your updated resume. Um, I think it's super important, in my opinion, to be more in depth than not. Um, I tell any person that I am sending off to an interview with one of our clients is to just go in depth about your experience. I think it's so important that whoever is interviewing you understands all of your experience from A to Z, pointing out or knowing, let's say, the job description, they need a specific EMR experience or EMR. Is it just me? I think we lost her audio. Yeah, I can't hear her. Okay. We lost your audio though for a second. Oh no. So Can you guys hear me? Yep. There you are. Okay. I'm back. Sorry. Um, so I just think, Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I just think addressing, um, what the, what the organization is looking for, um, tying it to your skills and your experience. And then I think lastly, um, it's actually more of like a follow-up after the interview. Just make sure you're always thanking the interviewer for their time, thanking them, the candidates that always stand out to Melissa and I are someone who is following up with an email. Hey, Kylie. Hey, Melissa. You know, thank you so much for this time. I'm super interested. Reminding them again why you're interested in that position and letting them know, um, you know, make sure that they don't need anything else. I think a lot of times maybe an updated resume or some references, it'll fall through the cracks and that makes the employer's job 10 times harder. So, just make sure you're really on top of it and always thank them. And I think a follow-up email makes you a shining star. Yeah. Tanya, what do you say? Um, I'm sorry. I got distracted reading the questions in the Q and a section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. What was the question there? So um, any tips for interviewing? Oh, um, you know, I, I did hear you say, Melissa, um, smiling. Was that you that said that or was that Kylie? One of you said that. And I think that's super important because in really, you know, being yourself, um, knowing about the, the position that you're applying for or the program that you're applying for, have at least one question at the end. I don't care what the question is, but I need you to have something to give me because that just shows me that you did research, that you care, that you aren't just here because I asked you to come at this time. So I think just being yourself is really important because if you're just kind of like trying to fit this role of the perfect candidate, it kind of doesn't really set you aside from anybody else. So, you know, wearing a little bit of color or, you know, whatever it is that makes you, you, you know, bring that with you and absolutely the resume too. I think that's important. Sure. Yeah. And, and this is, you know, I call this being proactive versus reactive. Um, you know, in the interviewing process. And, and um, you know, this came up in, in 
our engineering panel. It came up in our biotech panel. Um, same thing, right? You're looking for people who jump off the page at you. And one of the ways that you do that is by being proactive rather than reactive and just sitting back and waiting for the call to come in, make something happen. And that can be very, very important. It doesn't matter, um, you know, for, for it. it I had to interview for the president position and the same thing applied for me as it did for my very first internship at a TV station, right? Um, those principles hold, hold true your entire career. So um, great, great points. I, I love that. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the questions that just came in was um, how do you apply to be a PCR? I think maybe that was PSR as a high school student. Um, any, who, who was it that mentioned, was it PSR or PCR? Was that you, Tanya? Yeah, I did bring that up. Um, I mean, I can lightly talk about that, at least our clinic, but I think um, the girls over at MedX would probably be a little bit better to answer that question. Okay. Melissa, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, out of high school, um, you know, for PSRs, um, you know, sometimes our clinic, the clinic managers just require some knowledge of anything in the medical field. So if you're still in high school and, you, you know, you're you're trying to get your foot in the door early on, I would encourage you if there, if it is possible to look for programs in your high school where you can get exposed to medical terminology. Maybe if they're offering a class on anything medical related, take it, or even if it's like a, like a club or something, just anything. Sometimes our clinic managers are open to greener candidates, as long as they have some knowledge of the medical terminology, some knowledge of you know, the specialties or practice or anything. So again, if you're still in high school and you really want to just start getting your foot in the door working at a clinic um, as a PSR, anything of that sort, just look for different ways to volunteer in a medical clinic or just get exposed to the medical terminology so that when you do interview for a position like that, you're fairly comfortable with, um, you know, the different terms and everything like that. Okay. Um, one of the questions that was asked to us in advance was, um, I'd love to be a medical assistant in a pediatric office. What's the best way to move towards that goal? I guess what I would do is change it a little bit and say, if you, if you are, are angling toward a specific, you know, type of office, um, is there a difference? I mean, how do, how do you go about, you know, moving into a specialty? I guess, I guess it would be Kylie. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of times that experience isn't always required. They can't expect every applicant to already have previous experience in that specialty wanting to get into it. I do know, you know, people will volunteer and spend their time in um, that kind of field if you're open to that. Um, but I think in terms of going into a specialty, it's still going to be the basics. I think in terms of like medical assisting, um, vitals, injections, blood draws. Um, obviously, it's going to be, be different. For example, pediatrics, you're going to have to do that on babies and toddlers and children. But for example, if, if you have that experience prior to going into peds with adults um, or a different age group, it's still going to be very versatile. So um, I wish I had more to say there in terms of changing specialties. Um, maybe Tanya would know better. <laughs> Tanya, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, the pediatric department is usually rather sensitive about taking on people who don't have experience because mm. children are very reactive to anybody coming at them with needles or anything. <laughs> so, um, we like our internship program. Um, we used to place people in the pediatrics department and just because a lot of our students are new. They, you know, they're students, they're still learning. Um, the patients, the, the young children didn't really take well to that. So we, we don't really place them there now anymore. And um, that doesn't go to say that it's not likely to happen, but I think um, having confidence in yourself makes a big difference in that. So um, I think it really just depends on you as uh, you, whoever asked this question, like however you react to kids, I think it's kind of dependent on that, not so much your experience um yeah but i would yeah say. they can they can smell your fear right yeah they're like <laughs> <laughs> so um one of the other questions that i loved um we'll we'll this will be the last one and then i'll i'll ask ask you for any final thoughts um how hard or stressful are these jobs melissa i think 
you know, any job is stressful. Um, I think in, in the medic, when you're pursuing a medical assistant, you know, sometimes specialties might be a little bit more stressful depending on which one you go into, for instance, pediatrics. Um, it might be a little bit more, you know, not, I, I don't want to say challenging per se, but if you're not a fan of, you know, working with kids or your, um, you know, kids are a little bit more difficult sometimes when you're, you know, giving them an injection or drawing blood, um, it's different from, you know, an adult sometimes. So I would just say, um, you know, sometimes certain specialties are a little bit more challenging than others, but as long as you're educating yourself, getting involved, asking questions, um, you should be fine. Okay. Um, and I see that Kylie said that she has some questions uh, that she's posted um, and she said y'all. And so as a guy from Kentucky, um, I appreciate seeing the usage of y'all, even though I do also notice that it's part of your last name. So that's interesting. Um, but um, so I'm going to I'm going to toss it to you, Kylie. Um, any last thoughts, any last um, advice for, for our students? In general, overall, was that the question? Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, we're, we're wrapping it up. We've, we've thrown a lot at them. Is there yeah. anything that we've missed that you would, that you think that they should know? I really don't. If anyone has any specific questions or just wants to hop on the phone and chat, be happy to do so. I think interviewing and, you know, finding a job, I know people are really overwhelmed and I know that's a full-time job in and of itself and it can be stressful and, I just want people to know that just be confident in yourself, kind of like what Tanya said, like you're the only person that can be yourself. So just be confident. If you don't have the experience in licensure, don't think that you're just qualified from any position and getting yourself in the medical field. There's always opportunity. I hire people all the time from a call center or a customer service position that has some interest in medical and they do wonderful. So just always be confident in yourself and in your skills and feel free to reach out if you have any questions and just don't ever give up. There's always an opportunity out there. Don't just expect things to come your way after one or two applications. It takes time, but you know, it'll come with hard work. Right. Fantastic. Tanya, do you have anything final to say? Um, you know, I would just say, um, you know, good luck out there in your search. Everybody starts where you're at. So if you feel like you kind of get kicked over a few times, like don't let that stop you. Um, you know, everyone's got to start somewhere. So put a plan together and have the confidence in yourself and, you know, try hard. All right. Fantastic. And Melissa. Yes. I said this in the last one. I will say it again. Network, network, network. <laughs> Talk mm -hmm. to anyone and everyone in the field. Um, you never know who can help you get an opportunity or who can just help you with any questions you might have. So definitely get involved with anything that, um, that you think would be necessary in order for you to help grow in the field. All right. A uh, real quick question on networking. Is LinkedIn a valuable um, site for, for medical assisting for that? I was what? just going to say that. <laughs> okay. Yes, I think, um, you know, if you're a medical assistant and you come across a LinkedIn profile where maybe someone's been an MA for 10 years or an MA lead or something, um, I would encourage you to, you know, reach out to them, message them, send them a, an invite and message them, say, hey, I'm new to the field. I would love to, you know, maybe take you out for coffee or in this pandemic, do a virtual just one on one chat just to get to pick your brain a little bit about your experience in the field. Um, people are always usually more than happy to share their own experiences. So. All right. Fantastic. Yeah, I think I think a great tip would be to um, if you're interested, for example, like in pediatrics, you can search that like medical assistant pediatrics mm -hmm. or manager pediatrics and filter your county or location and add people and make the note personal. Hey, my name's, you know, Kylie. I'm a new medical assistant or I'm going to be graduating soon. I would love to just be a connection with you. Same goes for, you know, healthcare recruiters like myself, like I'm constantly posting job positions and that way you can just stay informed and stay connected. I think LinkedIn people forget how valuable of a resource it is and it's yeah. really easy to find people with the different searches and if you guys ever need training or help with LinkedIn, I'd be happy to do that for you. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you very much to all of our panelists. We really appreciate you. Um, I wish you could uh, hear clapping from everyone, but um, since it's a webinar, it's a little harder to do that. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to uh, ask that you turn off your webcams now, and we are going to turn it over to uh, Catherine Emily from Santa Ana College to talk about um, their program in medical assisting. So um, Catherine, it's all yours. 
Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you to Raquel for inviting me today. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'll just go through. Um, uh, Raquel, if I could share my screen, I think I'll go with um, a little. Uh, here we go. This is a um, presentation that I do for um, people in the community when I go out and network with employers. Um, there we go. Uh, where I'm explaining a little bit about our program. So we have uh, three faculty, uh, Carol Seitz, and we've added Dr. Jose Candelario to our um, team. Uh, we provide year-round programming. We have online courses. We have hybrid courses. We have weekend programming. With this COVID crisis, we've gone to remote instruction, which is we're having classes via Zoom and recorded lectures we have we call it synchronous and asynchronous instruction so the work for getting those certificates and that education that's required to work in the healthcare field is is alive and well so these are some of our program level objectives we've got communication skills one of the terms earlier used was soft skills soft skills are those things that make you a good interpersonal communicator speaking english reading and writing um, electronically on computers and in charts um, how you think and um, critically reason through scenarios, different kinds of patient scenarios that may not be predictable, um, how to work with a diverse community. Um, there's all different kinds of variables that go into play on, on how they all come together for your healthcare career. Um, our pathway is 15 units. The shortest amount of time that you can finish your certificate is six months. So for the students that started with beginning medical terminology this summer, they can also take advanced medical terminology next month with Dr. Candelario. And in the fall, they could pick up the other three courses, which are front office, back office and insurance and billing and basically Merry Christmas to you. You now have a certificate of achievement in December. Most students use two semesters, either fall or spring, to do three classes in one semester and two in another. We have a lot of different um, um, offerings in terms of electives. We've um, added uh, computer applications to the medical office and that helps with uh, navigating computer-based systems. Um, and electronic health records that you would see in the front and the back office. We have phlebotomy, which is a one unit certificate of achievement course. Uh, the college also offers CPT, uh, Certified Phlebotomy Technician Program through our community services. So phlebotomy skills are a high risk skill um, and, and high demand so that you are able to draw blood in your uh, clinical back office. So um, there's a myriad of um, classes, including the cooperative work experience course that you would use at the end of completing your five certificate of achievement classes. Uh, you're placed in a clinic, you go interview. Um, so those interviewing uh, suggestions by um, our panel were awesome about how to prepare yourself with confidence even though you may be a little bit deficient in your um, experience a lot of employers will take that 200 hours of a cooperative work experience course as a one year of experience and get you in you just need to get your foot in the door you need to make yourself the strongest candidate you can be as a medical assistant and that includes you know getting your CPR that includes knowing a little bit about a lot of things like billing billing is not my thing but I know a little bit about billing um, and that this whole big transition to ICD-10 was a big deal but people mastered it well um, we have um, students who go to work uh, in either the front or the back office. They go to uh, free clinics, they go to the hospital clinics, uh, they go to chalk, although with the COVID crisis, chalk basically uh, 
told our students that they couldn't go, our externs. So out of a group of 20 externs this past semester during the COVID crisis, five, only five, were not able to get to their number of work hours to get units. So they're actually working this summer to make those hours up as clinics are opening up more. The medical assistants have been helping with telemedicine and they have been doing interpreting for family members who uh, speak Spanish and Vietnamese and it's been a really good function for them to see this new mode of uh, delivery for uh, people to get their health care needs met. Um, so it's a uh, it's a really vibrant kind of program. With our clinical back office, we're looking at, again, remote instruction for our fall, and we're looking for um, some days on campus for lab hours, for vital signs, ECGs, uh, meds, injections, wound care, autoclaving. So we'll have five days of our 16 will be on campus getting those skills. Others will be on online videos, activities, testing, that kind of stuff uh, to make you feel that at the end of this course, um, you are going to be able to function in a career as a medical assistant. So uh, we don't have a waiting list. It's just open access, again, year round. So we offer classes in January for winter intercession. We or, um, have I think 15 course offerings for spring and fall and then we have summer offerings as well. The other thing that I was noticing from the chat was that students are really interested in transitioning from high school to college. So uh, Miss Raquel um, has um, articulation agreements with several of our um, high schools in the community where finishing your medical core classes will give you credit for our beginning medical terminology class. And so therefore, and it's free while you do the classes in high school. And then you have the other four classes. So by the time you finish high school, you're finished with your certificate of achievement and can go right to work with um, your certificate. We also offer bloodborne pathogens and that's been bloodborne and airborne pathogens and that's been really key during this COVID crisis. So I have my second class tomorrow um, as a matter of fact. Um, the other thing that I was going to make mention of is if you have your prize on nursing or even EMT, um, students can work as an MA with those five classes as they are making themselves a stronger candidate for their nursing school application. So nursing schools are getting flooded with very qualified applicants, but what makes you stand out in the crowd? Do you have a thousand hours of working with patients in a front or back office setting? Are you multilingual? Do you have um, military service for our country? Um, do you have a previous degree? So it might uh, be one of those things where you can do the 60 hours or the 60 units to get your degree, your AA degree, or even a bachelor's degree in health science. You can work as a medical assistant and get lots of experience. Medical assistants can work in so many different variable kinds of environment. When you feel like you've, you've mastered orthopedics, then you go to cardiac clinic, then you go to a respiratory clinic, then you go to an infectious disease clinic. So whatever you can do to make yourself a stronger applicant to interview and to get admission to these higher levels of um, um, education, more power to you. So that's a little bit about our program. Students love the work experience class. They love putting those scrubs on for the first time. Um, their parents and families ooh and ah over them and they're just so cute. Um, anyway, so I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and um, kind of just sign off and say thanks for inviting me today. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to stick around and help answer those. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Um, that's fantastic. And um, I see that a lot of people are using the chat. That's a great way to get information. Um, I see that Raquel posted her email address in there for people with questions. Um, Catherine, if you want to do the same, you can do that as well. So um, thank you very much for, for that overview. Um, so now we're going to turn to our last panel.